Now, church, if you can help me welcome my good friends, Pastor John Lufuluavo. Help me welcome Pastor Antlantla as well as they come to the, screen, uh, to the stage, as well as our spiritual father. Come on, church. Come on, put your hands together as they come. Come on, put your hands together as dad comes up. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Amen. You may take a seat. Amen. Check on two. All right. Okay. Amen. <laughs> I, I I feel I feel bad every time I have to do this. How how do you welcome a man to his house? I don't know. <laughs> It's very difficult. But church, on the far left is Pastor John Lufula. I was just telling Pastor Dumila right now, him and I go far back as, I think, high school. Um, if he's, he's, the, he's an eyewitness. He knows me back in my DJing days. I think they think I claim. I think they think, but don't tell any stories. <laughs> You'll embarrass me. Pastor John Lufula, we're doing a great work. He's the youth pastor at T TFG. Uh, it is not, not for the Fushini group, ne? Yeah, <laughs> uh, at uh, Assemblies of God, he's doing a great job, and we've got Pastor Ntlantla. He's under, he's at uh, CWC Calvary Worship Center under Bishop Mutula, a great man and a father in the land. He's also doing a great work in the youth of Soweto. This man is here rushing Soweto. <laughs> he's doing a great work, and obviously we have our own dad. Amen. You know, I feel like we should just move the pulpit. Yes, and please. So we can come together. You, look, you guys look like you're in Soweto. <laughs> come, let's, let's do this. Let's get closer to each other. Okay. All right. That, that's more like it. I think come closer. All right. So what you do, you move your chair a bit forward. Man. So at least um, uh, just at an angle. There you go. All right. Uh, yeah, that's more like it. Brother Masur, I know you're watching. Please, your team. <laughs> Cool. So can we kindly have Hebrews 6 verse 5? Or we can start from verse 3. The theme of the shutdown is not just something we pull from the sky, but it is scriptural. You know, uh, but the Bible says, uh, Paul starts first in verse 1 and 2. It's talking about babes dealing on the elementary stuff. And in verse 3, he says, God permitting, we will do so. In verse 4, Paul says, it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted in the goodness of the word and the powers of the age to come. That there's something that needs to be tasted. The word taste is an experience. It is not uh, 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 something that you... I know when you taste something in the physical or when you, with, with regards to food, you're just having a small nibble. But this is talking about a full experience of the powers of the age to come. And we see everything that's happening around in the world. The kingdom of darkness is intentional about the next generation. If you go to high schools and primary schools, you'll know that there are so many sangomas arising. And we wonder, why is the church not as intentional? I want to ask first, Pastor Ntlantla, I know you from Soweto, and these things are very common. You see all these things. What causes the church not to be so intentional? Greetings first. Greetings. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, I think um, the church not being intentional about these things that we are saying, um, I think sometimes we get too comfortable in our own space. And, you know, we, we, we will entertain those who come in and become part of us. You know, sometimes we tend to distance ourselves from what's happening around us and we keep ourselves within the walls. And, and sometimes it's really easy for for you to even look at them and just look at them as people who are from the other kingdom and they are just, they are, they're crazy, they are lost, instead of maybe having a burden that will then lead you to see what can be done. How can I invade the space, invade the culture and bring the culture of the kingdom? So I think, just to answer you shortly, um, we are just comfortable doing church and what we are used to that we don't see the need to really go out and, and invade and be the light of the world, as the scripture says. Amen, amen. Now, following up on to what Pastor Ntlantle said, we are too complacent. What are the things that can be done, and how can we break out of this level of complacency as the church? How do we, how do we 
get intentional? What are the things that we need? What is it that we, I mean, if you look at, if you look at Nigeria specifically, you see that there's a mighty move of God, there's a revival. And it's been, it can be dated back to fathers leaving a legacy. We don't see much of it in other parts of the world. How can we make a shift and a change to that? Just let us know, uh, Pastor John. Thank you so much. I greet you all. It's so good to be here, Apostle Felix. I honor you, sir. I, I think one of one of the key things that I I, know, I notice in our generation and what I notice in most parts of the world is that wherever God is not prioritized, there are certain things that will not take place. Because when we look at the list of our priorities, we see that we have school as a, as our priorities. Parents would want to push forward the agenda of having their kids go to school. Others would have their, 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 their children start businesses. Others would have their children in different things, which are, which are all good. However, the priority should be the kingdom of God. The Bible says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto. And I believe that in order for us to see what we desire to see, what the Bible says that we should see, we need to go back to what the Bible prescribes for us to do, which is to put God first. Putting God first in every area of our lives. That means that it, not, not only, you know, I've, I've noticed something uh, that in the Jewish community, I was speaking to one uh, person who's obviously a Jew, and they were telling me how the, the child training begins when they are still very young. Even when they're in South Africa here, they cannot live anywhere. They have specific places where they live. They cannot go to school anywhere. They, they have specific places where they go to school. Why? I asked them, why is, it, why is that the case? Why is it the case that you have to do all these things? Money has to go through the, your economy. And I understood that they have to put the agenda that they have first. And that means that also if we are able to do the same things with the kingdom of God, we will see a greater influence, a greater impact in our generation and even in the generation to come. And secondly, and I believe that it's a knowledge of things past because it, we need to be able to study patterns because the revivals that, has, that have happened in the past can happen now if we study the patterns. But I will expand more on that, but I don't want to take too much time on that. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you very much for that, brother. You know, one of the things about our spiritual father, like I see him as a product of, you know, he's, he's, he's been, he's received multiple impartation from great men of God. You can see from his spiritual heritage uh, being raised. You know, one of the things that dad not, does not say, and I picked up in a private conversation, dad once or used to be, uh, how can I put it, uh, like Bulovo to Pastor Apostle Felix. So that would, Bulovo in this context would be Apostle Felix and Bensini da Hosa would be Apostle Felix. So we, we, talk, we read about him in, 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 in stories. Dad interacted with him uh, from a per personal perspective. And when you look at men like Ben Sineda Hosa, you know his spiritual sons and you know his spiritual grandchildren. In South Africa, the pattern is not there. Dad, what can we do as this generation and the next generation to catch, not that we should miss what has been, what the legacy you've left, what can we do as the next generation, uh, all those in the 40s, 30s, and even the 20s, to ensure that what you carry does, goes on to the next generations? Well, um, I, I believe that the first thing that must happen is that there must be a hunger. Um, it was part of the things that uh, Pastor Nai spoke about yesterday. God never gives you anything you don't hunger for. God does not give you anything. How many of you, uh, you know, have, okay, well, this is a youth conference. I believe that not many people have children, but you have siblings. Have you ever seen your mother trying to force food into a baby that is full? What does the baby do? He respills it out. That's exactly what happens when there is no desire. You know, this generation needs to build a godly hunger for the things of God. And that we are not seeing in the church. You know, we are in a generation where we force people to come to church. We, we force people to pray. When we got born again, man, we were so on fire. Like, we were on fire. You, you couldn't stop us. 
We were beaten. We were chased out of the house. I, I mean, for me, the moment I got born again, I was so on fire that it irritated everything around my father. And he chased me out of the house. And I slept in church for one year inside a church building that has no windows, no doors, and had mosquitoes as my roommates. There is no hunger. You don't find that today. The young people don't have those kind of desires. And so God will never put something on you that you don't hunger for. You have to really, he has to see a genuine hunger and thirst before these things, you know, can come on you. So that's the first thing that needs to change in this generation. A hunger for the things of God. Blessed are they that do thirst and hunger after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that people also don't know the value of what fathers carry. In our generation, I mean, we saw these fathers. We used to seek for their blessing. I mean, being around someone like Archbishop Benson Idaosa, people like Bishop David Oedepo. I remember many times when I would look at Bishop David Oedepo and say, Father, whatever is in this man, let it come on me. He will be speaking. He doesn't know what I'm desiring while I'm sitting. But you'll find I'm speaking. A young boy is on Facebook. He can't get what I carry. It's not possible. He's on WhatsApp responding to messages. Yeah. There is no hunger. So the, 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 the second thing is you must have value for spiritual things. You must have what? Value. You know, recently, you know what I did recently? I was on holiday in Santorini, and while I was there, the Lord told me, he said, there is a farmer in this nation that is not going to be here for too long anymore. And what I should do, that the grace he carries is still sitting on him. Not even his own children has, this is what God told me. Look, I, I stand corrected, but man, that's what God said to me. That this thing has not been transferred. And he said to me, take venison, such as he loves, not such as I like and when he told me the venison, even me, I said, Lord Jesus, that's a lot of venison. But I did that. So we were sitting, I went to his house a few days ago. We were sitting in his house after I presented it, and he was just talking. And all of a sudden, he said, I feel this thing is here. And he said, stand up. Please hand on me and my wife, and so I release it. That's it. Now, if you see me operating in the next dimension, You'll be saying Apostle Felix has muti. Uh -uh. No. There is a hunger. You see, you must value spiritual things. Unfortunately, you know, blessings are not seen. So we don't value them. But they are the things that really make you. Are, you, are we here? They are the things that make you. The Bible said that Isaac, uh, Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubine. He said, but to Isaac, he gave his all. He gave all. What, what is the all that he gave Isaac? After you've given gifts, what's left? So what that all means is he gave Isaac what makes Abraham. So then you go down, the, 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 God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. By Genesis 13, Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Isaac, the same thing. He got so prosperous that the Philistines envied him because he had what his father had. I always say in the church, can you imagine if we have 50 Apostle Felix in this church? We would choke Satan out of South Africa. I promise you. We would choke. That is, people that we, we take this thing serious. So please place value on spiritual things. You're very young now. The things that make men are not seen. Are you here? You see, you wonder why very common uh, ritual killing and you know people going to slaughter someone and take their private part just to make money or to get positions now that the election is coming i mean i was in swaziland and i made it the, before i got on the pulpit the uh, the pastor said to me election is coming and one of the things that's predominant during election is that young girls are missing young children are missing and i made a decree i said any politician that would take any young girl, let judgment strike them. They called me back and said they caught some politicians with some young girls heading towards the bush to go and slaughter them. I received that call. So, so what am I saying? 
place value on the things you don't see. You see, the invisible things are the things that make men. If we tell you what is standing behind us, they are not seen. But when we stand here, we know we have backing. Hello? Amen. Yes. Amen. So please, place value on spiritual things. Place value on your coming to church. Place value on your giving, tithing. These are, these are, not, these are things that people don't see. But in the long run, I have been tithing since I got born again. Now today, people are wondering, how do they catch up with me? You can't catch up. It's impossible. I've laid so much foundation for success that you cannot catch up in any ramification. If you take me to them, make me the president of South Africa, this nation will succeed. By the blessing of the Lord of my life. It has nothing to do with who I am. It's just what is on me. And you see, when you receive these things, nobody can take them from you. You receive them in your spirit. So you take an apostle Felix, take me and put me in one jungle in Zimbabwe. Give me another 10 years. You will meet a church like this in Zimbabwe. Why? Because what makes a man is not what is on the outside. Place value on spiritual things. Sure. Sure. <laughs> now, 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 a little bit that you should know, the panel discussion is important that we have two pastors, but can you see the value of having wisdom? Amen. Amen. There's questions I have, but Dad, I want to ask a question. With the authority and the, the authority you carry, how does, because what I realize that we struggle with as the younger generation is that the more God gives us power, the more prideful we become. Right. How is it when you increase in rank, you remain humble? What are the keys that we need to take from that? Well, the truth is, you know, if you are a student of the Bible, you will understand that God, the one thing that will throw you away from God's presence is pride. That's what kills Satan. So even us who God has been privileged to give this certain level of authority, we are intentional to be humble. The Bible says now Moses is the meekest man on the face of the earth. And I mean, look at, he was the one that led three million people out of Egypt to, to the land. Well, obviously stopped in the wilderness, but there is a certain level of humility that as you go up, you intentionally have to, you know, because the Bible says God giveth more grace to what? To the humble. But he resisted the proud. So you have to on purpose. Look, it's not that we we don't feel it like oh man it's such a nice thing when you are giving such honor i remember one time i went to nigeria to preach and they picked me up with 40 cars with military police the national nta was waiting for me in the in the airport they were interviewing me man i felt like the president of the world but man you know after receiving that honor you know inside you you are telling yourself felix humble yourself this thing is just a facade. Just know that, listen, the moment this thing gets to your head, you are, you are finished. So you finish all that, you go to the hotel and kneel down before God and say, Lord, I give you all the glory for this honor that I've received. That's it. You pass it on immediately. Otherwise, something will start swelling in your head. And church, when your head is bigger than your neck, so bigger, uh, you have a problem. That's it. Sure. Amen. I hope you learned something from that. Because I strongly believe one of the reasons why us young people don't walk in power is because God can see our hearts and how prideful we are. Right. You know, a few, something happened a few days ago. Pastor Berenji touched on it last week when he was preaching. There was a young man um, who was doing his fourth year in engineering. Um, I don't know what he did, but he was apparently fasting. And something happened and he started hearing voices, you know. Um, he was, I think, I don't know, it was hunger but deviated. Um, Pastor Benji had an encounter with him. Pastor Novit had an encounter with him. We tried to call, I think they tried to call Pastor Victor, but he was not available. But this boy, if Pastor Benji were to give you details, you would see that this boy was fasting and seeking for something, but he caught a demon. Now, you spoke about hunger. How do we make sure that we hunger for pure things and avoid all, uh, or, I mean, if, if you hunger with the wrong motive, 
you could attract something that's not godly. How do we work on it uh, and, and ensure that we, we, we stay in the right place? Because longevity is another key that we need to look out for. How do we ensure that we stay on the right path with regards to our hunger? I think that this is a very, very important question because I, I've experienced the same a similar case where there was, a, there was a young man similar to that he caught us another spirit, and this spirit told him, started telling him that he needed to tell the choir um, the songs that they should sing, um, and um, and the, the spirit was also telling him the person that he was going to marry, who was also in the choir, and this was somewhat, you know, I was looking at it like, what kind of spirit did you catch? Because it came from a period where we were preaching on revival, we were preaching on the fire, catching the fire. However, whatever hunger you have, if you eat the wrong thing, you will have the wrong result. Imagine you are hungry and you eat something that is not edible. The result will be tragic. But it is eating the right thing that ensures proper growth, that ensures longevity, as you've mentioned, and hunger with the right knowledge, Bible knowledge. Because sometimes the, the, the spiritual realm is so vast to the point that you can catch anything if you are if you're not guided by light. Right. That is why this thing that nowadays we have um, people speaking of meditation, and they're doing meditation like the world speaks of meditation, not the way the Bible we speak of Bible meditation, but they speak of meditation where they clear their minds. We don't do that. We don't clear our mind. We focus on Jesus. The Bible says, "Looking unto Jesus." the author and the finisher of our faith. And so the, the, the real hunger or the true hunger must be a hunger that is based on true knowledge because the Bible says that the knowledge, shall, uh, the truth shall set you free. It is not any kind of knowledge that sets you free, but it is a truth. And Jesus says that I am the truth, the way and the life. And so the right knowledge based on the Bible well, what will allow this hunger to be sustained? Because you'll find that, you know, one thing that I realized, that, let me just say this. One thing that I've realized in churches is that we have uh, people that are operating in the dynamite dimension rather than the dynamo. This conference is speaking of power, right? Dynamite is a flash, it sparks. Right now it happens and it, it causes damage and then it dies. But dynamo is that thing that continues. Even after, you know, how, we, how do we generate electricity, power? It is something that is continuous, continuous. And that is what we struggle with, consistency. We struggle with that. Even our hunger is not consistent. We are hungry for a season, and then we are no longer hungry. We are hungry because we were looking for something, and once we catch, or, or even we catch just a glimpse of it, we disappear. You find that somebody, the moment he catches a glimpse of a revelation of God, he begins a ministry. You find that somebody catches a glimpse, begins to have Instagram live. I'm not against that. But I'm just saying, do not catch something small and, do some, and attempt to do something great with it. The Bible declares that before Jesus was able to begin his ministry, he went to be baptized. Not because he needed to as God, but as, as, a, as a son of God, as, as men. He needed to obey God. He needed to have that hunger as a man in order for him to catch something. The Bible says that the heavens open. On the same day, many people were being baptized. The Bible says it was not a special baptism service for Jesus. But it was on the same day while he was being baptized, his hunger, what he was looking for, determined what the voice spoke about. The voice did not say that this, these are my beloved sons, but said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because his hunger was placed with knowledge and also with the right motives, which was to please God. That is why he says to John, when John wanted to baptize him, he says, permit it to be so, so that we may fulfill all righteousness. Let, let, me, let me just add something to what you said. You know, church, look. I know as young people, we want to be powerful. We want to stand on the pulpit or go to anywhere and demonstrate the power of God. But I believe that, listen, power is something that is owned by God. The Bible says that all power 
belongs to him, okay? So if you want something from the one that owns the power, seek the person, not the power. I think that's where we are missing it. So if I come into God's presence and just worship him, adore him, just love on him, and pray to him, and believe, you know, spend time with him, what will happen is that as I come out from that place, I come out with a residue of him. Many years ago, I wanted to buy my late wife uh, a GLE. No, not GLE. It's a GLS, the longer Mercedes. So it was a used car. My wife really liked it. It was owned by somebody we know. But the guy has been a smoker, and he used to smoke in the car. He just bought the car. It was still very new. So he gave us to test drive the car for one week. Now, every, I even drove it to church. When I come out from the camp smelling of cigarette, and I have never smoked, because the residue of the presence of cigarette in that car came out with my clothes. That's how it is when you, when you just go seeking his presence. Stay in his presence. Lock yourself up with him. And don't worry about whether he empowers you or not. You will come out with power. But the moment you go seeking for this power, Satan knows what you are hungry for. I love what my dear friend, Apostle Joshua Selman said. He said, you know, one day one guy walked into my office. He was on a fast. In fact, in this church, I had stopped a young man who was on a 40 days fast. Was it 40 or 30 days? I, I said to him, I think he came to tell me on the 20-something day. I stopped him. I said, you don't have capacity for the fast you are going through. And because I could pick up in the spirit that if this guy continues this fast, before this fast is over, he's going to pick up a demon. There are certain fasts that you have to grow into. You have to, you have to be mature to go into. You don't just wake up and say, you know what? I will not eat the whole year until Jesus gives me power. No, you got, Satan is going to come as an angel of light. Because you don't know him. You know, I always say, before anybody comes here and says, you know what? I have authority. I have power. I can make decisions. Read the whole Bible first. If you have never read Bible cover to cover, don't go on that kind of fast. Because it's important that you enter and see God with knowledge. So Apostle Joshua said this guy was on a 40 days dry fast. He succeeded in doing the fast, which means he didn't eat food. And I think he was drinking, but he didn't eat food. But at the end of the fast, here he walks into Apostle Joshua Selman's office, with two bodyguards that were wearing white robe like him. And he said, he's now Jesus. <laughs> Apostle Joshua said, I looked at him, I knew, that, I knew that something else has entered this guy. But he came out from a fast. He was seeking for power. But he contacted a demon. So we need to be careful that we are not seeking for the things. Like they always say, don't seek for the creation, seek for the creator. Yes, sir. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Dad. Sure. Well, being cognizant of the time, I'm just going to ask Pastor Ntlantla one more question before we do our closing remarks. Um, I, I, I know there'll probably be backlash after this question uh, because I've received a lot of backlash for some of the questions or some of the conversations. You know, there was when Apostle Arumi was here last year. He made a prophecy concerning our spiritual father. Um, and I got backlash for that. You know, I'm like, well, uh, well, it's okay. Um, and the backlash mainly came from South Africans. President Lantla, we see God is doing everything. There's a wave of power, glory, pure, pure power, not mistake, not gimmicks. What are we lacking? As we, because sometimes we, 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 instead of introspecting, we throw rocks, you know. We, we barely ever sit down and do some introspection. I'm not saying God is not moving in other parts, but why do, not, why do we not see a continuation? You know, why do we, I mean, you are a son of Bishop Mutula, CWC, that is, if you've been in the faith for too long, you'll know who he is. We, 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 we don't know, we, we, we can't say anything. I mean, Reinhard Bonke walked with Richard and Giddy. He was the man who laid hands on him to become a mighty evangelist. The men who started AFM, IAG, Smith, all these men did great things in South Africa, but we are not seeing it build up. What are we doing as South Africans? 
what are we noticing in our generation? What are we noticing in our people? What is it that we are doing that's wrong and what can we do to fix it? Yeah, um, and I think as they were talking, as, as, as the father was talking and, and the pastor, when, I'm, when we look at our country, the issue of hunger, again, it comes up. Um, and also the consistency in the hunger. And also the issues of honor. When we look at other countries and other parts of the world, and we look at how they honor uh, the fathers or the servants of the Lord, and we look at our country, especially us young preachers in this country, everyone wants to be the father. Everyone wants to be... And also the issue of titles. People are not caring anything, but they are just looking for titles that will cover up for their lack of function. So there's no function, there's no track record, but I am apostle so-and-so. It's like we are, we are trying to achieve with the title what we are failing to labor for. That's right. You know, the labor, the genuine that's, that's power. the labor, the going to the secret place, seeking the Lord, which comes from a place of hunger. Because hunger really is a gift. A gift that when God gives you, it will allow you to, to go into deeper dimensions of God. Because hunger makes you want to eat. The only way to respond to hunger is to feed. So when I'm looking at our generation as, it's those combinations of hunger, of honor, of even wrong motives. Uh, the, the guys that are fasting, going on mountains, when you look at the motives, it's just that good thing. When I walk into a place, I want to walk in with an entourage. I want, to, I want to be on Facebook. I want to be celebrated. But there is no genuine desire to, to say, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth through me as a vessel in my, in my nation and in my generation. And also one more thing that I've been noticing lately, speaking to that question i believe as a nation we have our own identity our country has been struggling for the longest of time with identity you know back in the years everyone wanted to be like an american preacher now today everyone wants to be like our brothers um, are from nigeria they want to preach like them they want to sound like them and then i'm asking myself don't we have our own identity as a nation don't we have a heritage of faith as a nation? Don't we have our own landmarks, ancient landmarks as a nation? And, and so instead of undermining our own and celebrating people from outside, can we begin to learn from our own who have walked before us and find the ancient landmarks and the patterns and then we follow them in our own unique identity? Amen. Sure. Okay. Before we do our closing remarks, you know... Dad said something earlier on. He said that he went to go sow a seed. And the man who he went to go sow a seed to as a father in the, in the land. Now, it's, 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 and these are not to, we're not talking down on ourselves. Okay. I was saying to the youth earlier on, the Bible is simple. By their fruit you shall know them. Right. It's the Bible. Be fruitful and multiply. First command that God gives to man. Have fruit and multiply. By their fruit you shall know them. So if there's no result, something is wrong. Right? Why do we not have, I mean, God spoke to dad to go speak to a father in the land. To go sow a seed. In every single one of us in South Africa, the people who claim to be fathers, they were not visited. But God visits Apostle Felix. How do we end that disconnect? That? Like, how, how, how do we? Because one of the things I've been intentional about, I can't be saying I serve Apostle Felix, I carry his Bible, and there's no fruit of his work in my life. Yeah. How do we? I, the, it's not that I call dad that makes him my father. It's that I produce results like him. How do we end that gap, dad? Um, I think he spoke about something very important. There's one thing that is lacking in the nation is honor. And honor, you know, uh, Mike Murdoch, in one of the laws of um, success that he, he said, honor is the seed for access. Mm, yeah. And the moment you don't have honor, you can't access what these men have. Elijah said to Elisha, 
stop here, I'm going to Gilgal. He says, listen, as thy soul liveth, and as the Lord liveth, I will go with you. It was a test. He went with him. Then they got to a certain place. He now said to him, boy, what do you want? He said, listen, um, I want a double portion of your spirit. You know what the man answered him? If you see me when I'm caught up, meaning you have to be such in close proximity that even when I'm in the toilet and I'm poo-pooing and the smell of my poo-poo is around, you must smell it because I can be taken while I'm poo-pooing. Are you able to honor a man even in that type of mess? So that's where the problem is. People, people you know, once, once you find, like even amongst us here, Many are struggling with honor on father and mother. We understand that they did wrong. That they did wrong does not mean you don't honor them. Are we together? It, 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 listen, you can't you can give excuse against scripture. Honor your father and your mother. That your days may be long, that it may be well with you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So these are, these are things that we are struggling with. It's the issue of honor that we don't have. And it needs to come back to the body of Christ. There is no honor. People don't honor. I mean, look, we understand that many men of God have made a lot of blunder, honestly speaking. Look, even with us, we all know that there has been a lot of mess. People have taken advantage of people and... You know, they've done so much wrong to the body of Christ that, in, you know, it, it's now uh, spoken of by every Tom, Dick, and Harry on social media. So it's become like a pattern now on social media to dishonor men of God. Yeah. You will see somebody just bring out picture of so-and-so and say, these are all fake prophets. Yeah. I mean, how does somebody, a little boy like, there's a boy called Prof X, come out, put the picture of a day boy here and say, you, this guy has walked with God. He's 80 something years old. He's walked with God for almost 50, 60 years. Produce the kind of result that if they give you 10 lifetime of 100 years, you will not produce it. And you open your mouth and say he's a false prophet. Then you, you now know why people don't live long. People like that, you'll be surprised. One thing, one thing, he's gone. Because they will fade away. Except the, he said the scripture cannot be broken. Let every man be a liar. Let God, let God be true and let every man be a liar. We cannot get to the place of dishonor, church. If you see somebody, this is what we are now teaching the church. Even you as young people, I mean, you get into a bus and there's an elderly person that comes in. Stand up for the elder. Don't sit there with your 16-year-old self or 20-year-old self when an 80-year-old woman or 70, 60-year-old woman just came into the bus. Like really, he, she is standing, you are sitting. That's a high level of dishonor. You cannot carry grace like that. It has to come from a place of honor. Where these people know that you honor them. You honor them. Every, you see, everywhere I go, I intentionally honor people. It's an intentional thing. I go for my friend's birthday. I was in a friend's birthday, Pastor Vincent, not long ago. I gave him 22,000. As an offering. It's an honor for the grace on his life. He's, he's younger than me. Are we together? It's an honor. And these things have a way of speaking for you in high places. Please, we must learn the... See, this thing that you think you are grown and your mother is talking and you are looking at her with one corner of your eye. You are killing your destiny. This thing that your father will be speaking and say, this old man. What? I heard somebody say, you know... The father was calling him to come and do something. He said, let me just do this thing so this monkey can get off my back. Like, really? You don't last like that. Calling your father a monkey. And because you think you can now speak Queen Elizabeth English. No. Somebody say honor. Honor, honor must return back to the church. Amen. I believe is the reason why that I believe for me that God is struggled so much to deposit authority like we have seen in different parts of the world. We see, we've seen men like Maurice Cerullo. These men have lived their lives and created such ripple effects. I mean, the other day I heard Angel Hubert. I was very angry when I heard that. Angel Hubert said something. He said, 
which South African preacher can go outside of South Africa and, and fill up a stadium? When I heard that, I was so angry. I'm like, why, why do you even just talk against preachers? It's not right. But you know, I sat down and I thought, but anyway, instead of getting angry, is it true or not? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Then you now begin to think like, okay, the way it was said for me as an elder, the way it was said was very sarcastic. I don't think it should have been said that way. But you know, there is a way you communicate truth and it becomes an error. The way it was said was not right. But on a second thought, you now begin to think, how many people in this nation, in the gospel, can go outside, go to the United States, put a program together and gather 5,000? Go to England and gather 10,000? How many people can do that in our land? So that now begins to give you to now put you in a place where you begin to think, then something is wrong. Let's find a way to fix it. Instead of getting angry, there is a reason. Let me talk to, I know so many people are watching this and so many others will watch. But there is a reason why God allowed so many missionaries into South Africa. So many foreign pastors to come in here. I know, yes, some are skeleton. Some have done so much wrong thing. But they are genuine, authentic men of God. God sent into this nation. God called them and told them, South Africa is your base. And he sent them here because just like they beckoned on, on Saul, Paul, say, come to Macedonia because we need you. And, and instead of receiving that, what we do is that we're talking against. I remember one of our conferences, one of the fathers in the nation called me. Um, we just finished. It was last year's ownership. Is it last year or two years ago? The one we did when lockdown was still 2021, right. When it was still lockdown. I mean, we, they gave us 50, and we did that conference. We had almost, I don't know, 7,000 people in the, on this ground with 50. In fact, as a matter of fact, the president released us to 2,500 on the day the conference started. Now, he called me and he said these words. Elderly man in his 70s, he says, you know, we never believed in you foreigners. That was a statement that hit me like a bomb. I mean, listen, God help me. I pray he's not watching. But for a father like that to still see the body of Christ as foreigner, is an error. You and I are alien in this world. Whether we like it or not. Let me tell you, when God created the earth, there was no boundaries. It's human beings that divided South Africa and Zimbabwe. It's not, there was no boundary. It is a human being that divided uh, Botswana and South Africa. So, we're now talking as the world, where we now say, okay, you know, um, these are foreign, these are no foreign. That's why in our church, we don't know anything about foreigners. No, we are one in Christ. There is no foreign blood. It's nothing like that. It's one of the things I have against this dude called Gaston, is it Mackenzie? That, that he says he's going to go to the hospitals and pull out the oxygen of foreigners. He has no value for life. He can't be, that should, he doesn't qualify to be a president because he does not understand the value of people's life. Listen, what, do you know what Jesus compared to one soul? The whole world. And then now you now go and say you can go pull out an oxygen. Listen, if somebody from Ethiopia is sick on the bed, every Christian and is a Christian, we should all rally and pray that God heals him. Yeah. Are we together? It do, listen, as long as we name the name of Christ, we are one in Christ. And if we can have that mindset, so all this, this thing about foreign and non-foreign, let them go back to their country. I understand all that. But you see, you, you guys are young. In those years when there was a party, many black people took covering in African nations. And nobody told them to go back. Now that you are free, you are now telling people, go back, you are our greatest problem. That, that mindset needs to change for the body of Christ. It shouldn't be so. I hope that gets across. Amen. I hope it does. It's not an easy one to take. However, I think we need to sit down and take this in. 
I hope you were not offended. We have quite hard uh, topics here and uh, uh, quite hard responses, but something needs to change. So we need to take this, sit down, evaluate. I'm praying that in our generation, Felix will not go with his mental. I, I'm, I'm praying that will not go Amen. with his mental. Amen. Dad, you're not going with your mental. No, you in know. Jesus' you, name. You will no, not. while I'm alive, all of you will be having double portions. Amen. It's, there's nothing like I have to go. In, in, uh -uh. in, in, in fact, in fact, Dad, it's actually happening. Do you know we have two 22-year-olds with properties in their name in Alive Youth? Definitely. Dad has their mental of property, and it must happen. I just want to ask you, young people, I know there's a lot of things that are being said. Um, just take your Christianity seriously. Yeah. These things can be received while our fathers are still here. Yes. These things can still be received. We can carry these mentals. I, I, my desire, you know, I, I say this, they, they always fight me, but I tell every single young person, we do a lot of overnights, we do a lot of prayers, I spend a lot of time with them, but whatever happens, even if I raise the dead before you, I'll never be your father. You have one spiritual father. Right. Am I saying this to please you? Have I not said it before? How many of you have heard me say that? And quite a lot of people have heard me say that. Why? Because what makes me me is sitting upon Apostle Felix. So if you want to, to be like him, follow him. South Africans, if your spiritual father's out there, just follow him and honor him, obey him. What our fathers carry helps us. Prime example, Pastor Colin Malunek. Amen. There's a lot of people who I speak to and I say he's a byproduct of this church and they say, no, you're lying. But what he's doing is replicating the results. He didn't wait for dad to go. Dad is still alive right here. He's still riding around and he's still standing strong. No problem, no ache. In actual fact, dad looks too good for a 50-year-old. <laughs> you see other 50-year-olds, hey, you, you know it's, it's, it's trouble. But when you look at Pastor Colin, you know that there's value in paying honor to your spiritual fathers. Amen. Now in closing, closing, any closing remarks, we'll start with Pastor John. Start will go with Pastor Antlantla, and Dad will close it off. Amen. All right. This, is, this has been insightful, not, I believe, not only for you, but also for me. Uh, I've learned quite a lot from Apostle and Pastor. One thing that I would like to end with um, is that while they were speaking, one thing that kept on coming back to my mind was that there are those that, want, that would rather have you run with it, meaning that the kingdom agenda, the kingdom plans, it is your plan, run with it. And they see, they see no part that they can play in that agenda that God has for our time and in our generation. And that is one of the things that we see in South Africa, that indifference, that these things are for the apostles, for the prophets, for the pastors. And I have no business in that. I just come to church and I leave. And if we are to see a difference in our generation, in our university, in our schools, that we need to take ownership of the commission that God has given to us. That's right. You know, we come to church for the equipping. We come to church for the training so that we go out there and do the work of ministry. The work of ministry is not only for the pastors that will stand on the pulpit to preach, but the work of ministry is for you to do as you leave this place Monday through Friday until, and then you come for a recharge, and then you go back again. And, and my prayer and my, the wish, the desire of my heart is that really you, you take consciousness of the calling of God upon your life. That you should not wait for a title for you to become a true epistle for your generation. Right. That you should not wait for you to be ordained in order for you to be able to preach in your universities. You know, I always say that the reflection of the church, you know, when you sit here and you see maybe there may be an empty seat next to you, it is not the reflection of the, your leader. It is not the, re the reflection, of, it is your reflection. It is a reflection of your inability or maybe your abilities. That's how far you have been able to go. And that we pray, I pray really that you take consciousness of whatsoever God has planned for us in this season. And this is one prayer that I always pray, that God help 
me to do whatever you want to do in this season without missing a bit. I don't want to miss anything because I was too distracted. I was too busy with school. I was too busy with work that I did not do what you want me, wanted me to do. Sometimes you go into a new job and you do not realize that God put you in there on assignment. You don't realize that God allowed you to be accepted at VERT, not, not because there, there were no other people that could be there, but because you're on assignment. And the Bible says it is impossible for those that have tasted these things to go back, to go backwards. And it is for us to expose them to these things. And that is my cry, my desire, that we be conscious of the calling of God, the agenda of God for our time and for our season. Amen. Um, I just want to, for me, my closing remarks will be still gulentole of hunger. You know, that my prayer for us is that may God give us a genuine, genuine hunger for him. Not just for what we can get in him, but for him as the lover of our souls, as our maker, as the author of our lives and the author of our salvation, that we may have a genuine hunger for him. You know, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6, the Bible says, um, he's a, he's a, he says those who come to God must first believe, must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. They seek him. And then he says to Abraham in the book of Genesis, he says, Abraham, I am your exceedingly great reward. Which means he, in seeking him, he becomes our ultimate reward. So not what we get when we seek him, but him, Yahweh, the God of Israel, the almighty God, him becomes our exceedingly great reward. So as we press on to him, as we seek him, we desire more. We are not seeking him so that I can get married. I'm not seeking him for a wife. I'm not seeking him for a job or for a promotion. But I'm seeking him for him. And I long and hunger for God, for God. As the disciples of John, as I'm closing this, the disciples of John are following. Jesus says, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Bible says, they left John, the disciples of John. They followed Jesus. Jesus looks back finds these guys are following him he asks them a question he says what are you seeking for and they give him an answer they say we want we are seeking for where you dwell we are seeking for your dwelling so meaning we are seeking for your presence we want to abide with you so may we seek him for he, for where he dwells may god bless you amen well um, I want to say to the youth, um, haven't picked up the emphasis of heaven now for this nation. The eyes of the Lord are on the youth. Um, you know, one of the things plaguing Africans is that they don't know when their time has expired. And that's what's happening to many of our old politicians. You find out that many of the leaders of Africa have expired. They go to meetings and they sleep because their body is tired. They still want to be president at 90. But the emphasis of heaven now as South Africa today is on the youth. Amen. And all I want to say to you is that peradventure you are here. Let's say you were given the position to be a president of this nation. Are you ready? You see, so start preparing for where you are going. Because God is preparing you for something great. Are you ready for what next? These old people, I think Africa is tired of these old men. They don't want to leave power. They know they are wrong. They know they can't handle the pressure. Look at, I mean, look at the decadence that we have seen in South Africa. I happen to have been in this nation now for 23 years. And from 23 years ago till today, things have degenerated. I mean, we have reached a point now where they say 80 people die from violence, gunshot, every day. And the leaders know it and they can't do anything about it. It shows they are tired. 
Africans need to know when God is moving them out of the way. The Lord spoke to me. I was on a three days dry fasting on this altar. He said, make Pastor Keiji the resident pastor of this church so that I can get out of the way and I will go to the nations. That's it. If I say I want to hold on to this pulpit, after all, I build this with all, eh, you built what? No, God built it. You should know when to exit and uh, until Africa gets to that point, we will keep running around in circle. The leaders of this nation are all tired. If we face fact, they don't know what to do. They need to leave this thing for young minds who still know how to figure out things, who can come up with technologies that will solve the problem of this nation. You'll be surprised if they can pick one guy from varsity, make him the head of ESCOM. You'll be surprised. But they will not because they will, they're still looking for some gray-headed man who has no sense, who is tired. When he's in board meeting, after five minutes, he starts snoring. We can't go forward like that. The emphasis is on the youth. Prepare yourself for greatness. Prepare to run banks, even at your age. John Dell, the owner of Dell Computers, began Dell at 19. Are we together? Look at all these great men. Many of them started in their, in their teens and in their, in their teenage years. Some of you are too old. You are too old. And they're still pursuing you to go and wash your underwear. How will, you, how will God trust you if you, you're wearing one underwear for six days? God can't trust you like that. No, prepare for where you are going. You can't make your own bed. You stand up in the morning, dash out of the house. You can't even make your bed. How do we commit a nation to you? Okay, you won't like me. I know you. There will be no clap. I know. I understand. But you see, church, you prepare for greatness. Greatness doesn't just land on you. You prepare for it. Greatness can kill you. I said this morning in our prayer time when we were praying in church here, I said, rising is very easy. But the greatest challenge is staying on top. Many people rise and they fall. And that is with most Christians because we don't have what it takes. We didn't go through process. We didn't learn the process to get up. Emphasis is on you now. You are the owners of Absa Bank today. You are the owners of NetBank today. You are the owners of Standard Bank today. You are the ones that will run the economy today. Say amen, somebody. So if you are ready for that, you will see God begin to take these people out and God will begin to make you. I read a scripture and all the people gathered, Second Chronicles 26, and made Uzziah the king. 16 years old was Uzziah when he became the king of, Egypt, of Israel. But the Bible says now, the guy began to seek God in the days of Zechariah. Meaning that as soon as this boy was made king by men, he never forsook God. Look at many, uh, today I hear that some our leaders, some of our leaders in university were, in the, were born again Christians. Today they are going to the mosque to bow their head. They are forsaking God. A nation where we can marry two men and give them two marriage certificates, we have crisis. We have a serious problem. It's a nation of godless leaders. And that's why I was saying that in this next election, I've registered, it's so hard to find who to vote for. It's like bringing two demons in front of me and say, choose one. How do you choose a demon? You know what I'm saying? But it's just that we have to vote. Because when I look at everyone who's there, my question is, who is there that will represent God? Because I'm not, I'm, I'm not after what they are doing out there. No, they are, that's their problem. I'm in the kingdom of God, and I represent the kingdom. I'm a representative of God's kingdom. So my, my own is, who will represent the kingdom of God? Who are we going to look at and say, this is our leader. He would, when he gets there, he will call for national day of prayer. He will call for a day of fasting for us to banish this ESCOM issue of load shedding. Because these things are spiritual. I saw Nigeria go into decadence from electricity problem. 
Because the first thing Satan, remember, the first thing God said is, let there be light. Whenever Satan wants to destroy a nation, he takes light. Once he takes light, the nation is gone. So don't look at it as it's just physical light. It's a lie. You know how many, do you know, now they say today, South Africa has the highest number of unemployment in the whole of Africa. Why? Because light has been taken. Businesses are struggling. People are struggling. They can't keep their staff. They can't pay salaries. So you find now a youth here is in varsity studying engineering. He finishes and stays unemployed for five years. What's the point? After your father suffered, your mother suffered to pay your school fees for university, you come out and you're still in their house eating their pap and flakes for the next five years. No, that's not right. But it's because these old men don't know when to get out. And we are praying that if they don't get out, God will take them out. That's our prayer. So that the young can take over. Are we together? Amen. Come on, how many of you are blessed this evening? How many of you are blessed this evening? This is not an informative session, it's a transformative session. I want to thank our spiritual father, dad, thank you very much. Um, we, other, other men don't allow their youth together, but that is the person who, I said, I, I stood with him yesterday, I said, dad, do you have any specific instructions? I said, no, go, go for it, have fun, do you guys. Thank you, dad, for being so intentional with us, amen. For every retreat we have, we go, we, we, we hide in the bushes. Dad is always there. You know, so thank you very much, Dad. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you very much. Pastor Antlantla, thank you very much, brother. He's doing a great work in Soweto. I, I, I know that, you know, I, I grew up in Soweto. In actual fact, where his church is, I used to live, he, his church is in Deep Cliff Zone 6. I used to live in Zone 2. So I could literally walk five minutes to where his church is. And I know any time I drive to Soweto, man, my heart breaks. Pastor Benji was telling me about the number of Sangomas that are rising. But we thank God for men like Pastor Ntlantla uh, uh, that the God will win back Soweto. That in the day... In, in the 90s, late 90s, we had the men like Ntate Tere Hadi, Rale Cholela, Memanete Chaba, great, great, great women of God who were doing great things for God. And it, it will be restored in our day. Thank you very much for the work that you are doing. And my beloved brother, thank you very much. Pastor John, pastors are very great youth. They are just like us. No time for games, no time for anything. We Prayer, word, worship. And that's it. Why? Because only Jesus that we want. Amen. Come on, let's all stand to our feet. Thank you very much. This has been awesome. Thank you, Dad. Thank you very much. Amen. Let's just welcome the worship team as we take one song before we, we get into the word. At this moment, I'd like to just ask us to just lift up our hands, focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. It's, it's, it's just focusing on Jesus that we get what we want. In actual fact, we don't just get what we want. We get what he has preordained ordained and predestined for us. So let's just lift up our hands and close our eyes and just give him our focus. Where you are for the next few minutes. Just give him all your attention. Just focus on him. you desire him. Let hunger fill this room tonight. Let a hunger begin to fill this room tonight. Your presence is my one desire. Your presence is my one desire. Is my one desire. Oh, your presence is my one desire. Oh, 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 oh. yes, we long for you. Oh, 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 oh. We sing your prayer. 
presence is my one desire. Presence is my one desire. Your presence is my one desire. Your presence is my one desire. Oh, I all glory. in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ as we pray this song Father God in the name of the Lord we come here Father God with humble hearts asking you for your presence tonight manifest yourself manifest yourself in the book of Exodus chapter 24 Father God after you told Moses to come up the mountain he spent there six days he was out there on the seventh Father God you called him into the cloud Lord we are asking as we stand before you on this holy hill Father God Call us into the cloud that we may see you face to face. Bring us into the place of Panim El Panim. Lord, we desire for your word. Just for 10 seconds, just align your heart. If you are where you are, just close your eyes and prepare your heart for the, for the word of God. Just prepare your heart for the word of God. The Bible said that creation, the spirit of God, hovered over the surface of the water, waiting for the word to be spoken. Ask the Lord that Lord hover over my heart. That at the speaking and the release of the word of God, every single thing will begin to manifest. We ask you, O God, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, 
that at the entrance of your word, Father God, there will be light here tonight, and that there will be understanding to those that are simple. Lord, we ask in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, even as you are here in this atmosphere, O oh God, capture our hearts. May we be captivated with your word, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You know, I perceive strongly that God wants to release something heavy here tonight. One of the things I normally say is that when you perceive that God wants to speak in that moment, focus on Jesus. I would urge you that throughout the whole service, pray in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because God wants to do something in your life. You have a dear brother and friend of mine. I love this man with everything in me. He's been with me through the toughest of times. Man, I could even share a tear. Last year I was going through a very bad season and he was standing with me. Nobody knew what, was, what I was going through. Only dad, my wife and him. No one else knew. In actual fact, only him till date. My dad, my dad and my wife, only they knew. And he would stand with me, prayed for me every single time, every single season. He walked with me. He's one of those people when I look at him, I know that God truly loves me. He's a man who's passionate about the Word of God. He's a man who's passionate about prayer. He didn't come alone. He came with his beautiful wife. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to put your hands together. If you notice me, you'll notice that I keep good men with good wives. Not only just good, but they're beautiful as well. So don't say God spoke to you and told you that Pastor Dumelo is your husband. No, that's not God. It's a spirit you pulled from somewhere. Amen without wasting of time. If you were here last year, you know that God is about to do something. God is about to do something. God is about to do something. Now church, with excitement in your heart and joy in your heart, come on, put your hands together and help me welcome Pastor Tumelo Mushi. Come on church, come on church, come on church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This place is charged. Uh, yeah. Can we just focus on the Lord, Father? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We came here expecting you. We came here hungry for you. And we will not leave without being filled. Yeah. Our hearts are ready and open to receive of you. Spirit of the living God, we love you. We honor you. You are the epitome of our heart satisfaction. All that is within us longs for you. You are the reason why we stand. In you we live, in you we breathe. In you we have our being. Outside of you there is no us. So we thank you. And we bless your name. We bless your name. Amen and amen. While we're still standing, I'd just like to honor Apostle Felix. Uh, amen, amen, amen. Yeah. And as well as who Pastor Bulelo in her absence. Uh, he's, he's the coolest apostle around. Uh, swaggy fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to honor the presence of uh, the men and women of God in our midst, uh, the leaders of the church. Uh, yeah, on all you beautiful people in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, special honor to my darling. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's, she's the love of my life. Uh, I think my daughter is also here. I saw her spiritual dancing somewhere, uh, wherever she is. Be greeted, young one. <laughs> um, Pastor KG, 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have words. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, in as much as you say, I have stood with you uh, in hard times. I feel like uh, that sentiment is more from me towards you, you know. And thank you, thank you. I don't want to get emotional, so I'll keep it there. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm very nervous, mainly because uh, of Apostle Felix. <laughs> and if you see me shaking, it's not the anointing. Uh, I'm very nervous, you know, so just say a prayer for me. Uh, and just before we get into the word, uh, just to anchor my nerves, um, is this song in my heart. I'm not sure if you know it. Uh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Sanctuary, Sanctuary. Lord, for you. Lord, for you. One more time. Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me to be. Pure and holy. Yes. Tried and true. With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. I'll be. Sanctuary, sanctuary, Lord for you, Lord for you. Let our King be lifted. Hosanna, Hosanna, let our king to the Angombano, Leve Leve Makali Vanskan Sebe, the fellow Broskens Kebeneta. Londre escabo escabo makalivans kabalatalo lerga gana toroma lero ki ya raise it ya tola ya tola ya tola he's our king he's our lord giver he's the ancient of days One more time, let our kids. 
your seat in the presence of the Lord. Thank you so much. You guys are dangerous. You just stare things. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I'm going to try my best to work with time. Um, I feel like there's a lot that the Lord wants to do. And I pray that I'm able to squeeze in everything uh, within the allotted time. Uh, let's go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Let's start it from chapter 5. Book of Hebrews from chapter 5, I believe it's verse 12. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure whether I should read it first or give you a background. Um, okay, let's read. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again can you say again the first principles of the oracles of god and you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a babe but solid food belongs to those who are of full age some of your versions will say the mature that that is those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ let us go on to perfection to completion to maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms of laying on of hands of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment and this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible. This is one of the saddest verse, uh, verses in the Bible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Who and have tasted the heavenly gift. And have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And have tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the son of God and put him to an open shame okay uh, if God permits we'll touch on the rest of the chapter but just to give you guys a background so the book of Hebrews was uh, written to Jewish Christians who were orientated in uh, the Greek culture, you know, and one of uh, the, the, the entire book actually is dedicated towards them. So you will see that uh, all throughout the book of Hebrews, there's rich heritage of the imagery of the Torah yeah? because where they were as a culture or as uh, circumstances uh, would give is that they were under a lot of challenges and under a lot of affliction and they were in a place where it seems like their faith in Jesus is vain are we all together so the temptation to fall away here wasn't too much to fall into sin it was actually to fall back into Judaism where they were delivered from and into so you'll notice that when you start in the book of hebrews there's a lot of comparison to where they came from 
because they thought that was better than Christ. Linkira nevers. Is it making sense? So, so you open up chapter 1 and there's a comparison to Christ and angels. You come into chapter 2, uh, there's a comparison between Christ and the rest that Joshua gave them. That Christ is actually better than Canaan. If not so, there wouldn't be another day that was prophesied of rest. You come into chapter 3, he is greater than Moses. The very same person that you are trying to go back to. He is greater than Aaron and the order of priesthood. Coming into chapter 4 and chapter 5. He is greater than the greatest covenants that you know. Linkira Nevers, is it making sense? You know, see, he is greater than everything that you want to fall back into. So your temptation to fall away, which is actually to fall back into Judaism, is you falling into an inferior reality to the one that Christ has achieved. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to reconfigure their minds that let's go back in argument's sake and see where you want to go and when we compare every reality that you want to delve back into nothing compares with where you are now can i take a slight detour if we were to convert that circumstance to where we are now it is what is going on with this whole african spirituality thing Because it seems like this Christ that we have chosen is not working. Now let's go back to Abogogo, Abomkulu, the way of the ancients, which is actually no way at all. My God, geographical locations do not have a religion. What I mean to say by that is you cannot call it African spirituality. Africa is the land, ironically, that God created. So already the the, the, the debate is flawed there. Who came up with that way that our ancestors are said to have worshipped? Why are you so confident in where you are going? Whereas your grand, your forefathers in the days of their living didn't know. Aliba, Aliba, man, are we so confident because we, we have this fidelity and search for identity? My God, and we, we don't have the diligence to trace it back to God. So, so we want to find comfort in Abogogo, Abomkulu. I know I'm getting in trouble for this, but it's for your own edification. Where you are going to is inferior to where we are now. Now, let's deal with the complexities. Uh, we, we are living in circumstances. There are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of things. It seems like this Christ that we have chosen is not enough. Which is the same thing that the writer of Hebrews is dealing with. Now, let's get into some Bible study. Say Bible study. It's important that you study your word. So, I don't think I'll have the time to touch on everything. Uh, That's what we call apostasy. Apostasy means a falling away, a backsliding. And scripture gives us four main things that uh, 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 leads to to apostasy uh, number one I'll get into more detail let's start with number two number two is deceitful and seductive spirits and the doctrines of demons so you will notice that some of these people that are going into their tangents had a visitation <sighs> if you want to do your study this is uh, first Timothy chapter four ne? I don't have the time to Uh, do it justice number three on the list is uh, being misled by hypocritical liars this is basically the messages that come from people whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron they have a form of godliness they seem to worship christ but in actual fact they worship their stomach they worship their appetite They are not interested in reconciling their lifestyle with that which God has intended. 
so they stand on a, a platforms to discourage you who have a genuine faith in God to say where you are going I have been and it doesn't work be careful of those yeah, the, if you read the whole account of the book of Timothy Paul speaks about not entertaining certain uh, debates and discussions because the people you are engaging with have no appetite for truth they, they are actually after controversies so even if you are to win a debate with them they are not going to adopt that truth as the truth I would mention names but I want to be politically correct that, that public figure that you are afraid of with with African spirituality and whatnot has been defeated in more than three counts of debates by another man of God in our own nation and the same person keeps on going to other platforms to believers that don't know too much bringing up the same pieces of knowledge that he was uh, defeated within an open debate because he's not after truth He's after controversies. So you don't engage with such people. You ignore them. Number four. Uh, this is the, the one in uh, the book of uh, Thessalonians that talks about a great falling away that comes uh, at the revelation of the man of lawlessness, the, the Antichrist. Né? But what I want to deal with here is not growing in Christ. That's number one not growing in Christ that is what's happening in the book of Hebrews <sighs> are we all together I know it's a bit intense I just need to do some Bible study and get to the things that you want to hear but let's let's do the text some justice so he, he says Uguti, there are so many things I want to share with you but sermons have become very hard to teach because you have become dull of hearing and when you do a study on the word dull it means sluggish it means the kind of person that, le the, that listens to a sermon and doesn't dare revisit the truths so next year this time when you give them the same word that was preached last year it's new to them they are sluggish so, so migrating with people like that is very hard because they have the appetite to taste but not to pursue to fullness. That's why the believers that we are training in our day have to be taught about the appetite of pursuing truth. It's a lifelong study that we have of God. So what was happening in this day is that they, they would hear a very nice uh, uh, sermon, for lack of a better word, that would refute everything that they are struggling with theologically. But they are doing this thing that the youth tends to do in our day, of you should come hear my pastor, he's powerful. The truth has not become personalized. It remains external to you. So you've heard it, but it's not embodied. You've heard it, but you are not going anywhere with the truth that you heard. There's no growth. So he opens up chapter 6 saying, Let us go on to maturity, not having to lay these things again because you've heard them. So, so he says you have come to need milk say need milk not want milk need milk meaning you have a deficiency milk in the life of a baby achieves a development need and you guys are very far in terms of age but you need something in your body And although I want to introduce you to higher realms in Christ called solid food, you have come to need this fundamental thing that you were already exposed to but didn't continue in. 
so before we advance we have to satisfy this development need otherwise the meat will choke you I wouldn't I won't have the time to touch on this but he says uh, 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 everyone that is still on milk is unskilled regarding the word of righteousness and that's where God wants us I, I pray that God would permit us to at least touch that reality uh, I need to speed up because time ne? Then he talks about strong meat being for the full of age, the mature, who by reason of use. So now he, he's introducing a very interesting concept that, that the mature have an exercise that they are doing. They, they, they are not touching the sermons and leaving them. They, they, they are exercising habitual use of the truths they are engaging in. They don't stop. Can I make an example? Have, have you uh, noticed that uh, when you come into fasting, fasting and praying and all of that, uh, uh, you, you, let's say you go for a week, that your, your body starts adjusting to the new continual pattern. And when you break that fast, it is not wise. If you've never heard this, please don't do it. Don't start with meat. Because your body has acclimatized to not eating. So to reconfigure the body, you start it easy. Take your liquids, take your soup, take your vegetables. Then your body becomes re-acclimatized and capacitated to take in more. Not necessarily because you ate once, but because you are continuing to eat which tells your body I'm ready for meat but if you break that thing and you go and have a steak at 10 and tender you are in trouble and your body will tell you I was not ready for what I ate so, so the mature understand the art of constantly engaging that we don't do event based Christianity our study of God is lifelong and daily. And the more we exercise with the truth, the more your mind expands, the more your spirit expands, the more your heart expands. All of a sudden, your dream life changes. The texture of your visions change because there's an organ in you that's being exercised continually. You wake up, you read the word, you study the word, you pray. Lifelong exercise of that causes your spirit man to achieve a level of freedom because you can handle this thing by reason of your use. What I'm saying is this. Don't open your Bible Sunday to Sunday. Every day, engage with your word. I'll get into that a bit more later. But this is something that the mature have stumbled over and are practicing. And as they practice this, they notice that they are discerning their judgment. This is uh, not the gift of discerning of spirits. No? This is the faculty of judging, of discerning, of affirming what is true and what is not. This is uh, the, the expansion of your mental faculty into a spiritual realm of understanding. I know I said a lot. Does it make sense? All right, let, let's move on now. Yeah, they have their senses exercised. Uh, yeah, I touched on that. So, <sighs> time. <laughs> but 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 we'll we'll try. Let. <sighs> okay, okay. Let's go to First John. First John. I know you came to hear about power, but we need to build it up. <laughs> 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 
Let's let's go to First John. Can I quote it to save time? Actually, uh, so so he says, "I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning." I write to you, children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God is in you, and you've overcome the evil one. And he's talking to three levels of maturity. When he speaks of fathers, the mature, he repeats the same thing twice. Because you have known him who is from the beginning. Just to make an example, children, uh, I have a daughter now, uh, I, I cannot, as a father, I cannot fellowship with her on the level to which I delight to fellowship. Everything is on her terms. So our speech is something like this, daddy, 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 purple, like wow, purple girl. It's limited. I can't express my heart to her. But do we fellowship? Yes. To young men, the fellowship graduates. They start being acquainted with responsibility. So these are the type of people that, uh, for instance, uh, let's say my daughter grows up and she's now 12 and uh, uh, we are speaking as a family and I'm like, you know what, uh, I have to rush to see uh, Pastor Katliso tomorrow. And when I get up in the morning, I find that she has finished cleaning my car. She's become acquainted with the responsibility that pleases and makes life for the father easy. But to fathers, he repeats the same thing twice. You have known him who is from the beginning. Meaning these guys fellowship in a realm of intimacy. It's about heart expression and heart connection. Where I don't have to change my language to accommodate your age. You are skilled in hearing. Not at the level of my speech, but discerning the heart with which I say things. Those are the fathers now. Can, can we progress? Does it make sense? Let's move on. So, I forgot to touch on some things, but hey, we don't have time. Hey, just say a prayer for me. <laughs> so, 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 he, he, he touches on the powers of the age to come. Ne? And uh, when, when, because of the historical backdrop, the things that he was touching on are the similitude of what has happened in the Old Testament, coming into the Gospels and coming into the Acts of the Apostles and going forward. Ne? Uguti, uh, uh, they, they tasted of the heavenly gift. Some scholars believe this is manna because it came from heaven that those who were once enlightened, not just talking about spiritual knowledge, but talking about the cloud that would light up at night and lead the way for them. And during the day, it was a pillar. It, it, it lightened their path, gave them direction, pulled them to where God wants them to go. To those who were partakers of the Holy Spirit, both Upon them as an anointing and the indwelling. Do you know that scripture that says uh, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in us is a down payment guaranteeing what is to? So we are partaking. Uh, come on, come on, let's study together of something that we don't have the fullness of the expression of because it's ahead of our time. 
but we have the down payment so when he comes to the powers of the age to come he's talking about the transcendence that the ability to pull something that is not from the dispensation into that dispensation in the form of signs wonders miracles and there's much more to it but you've seen it in the old testament you've seen it in parts of the new testament that they pulled a realm that was not allowed now let's journey a bit further first corinthians chapter 2 i hope i'm not confusing you does it make sense say jesus if it makes sense all right okay Askis Media Team, I think I'm going to give you a whole lot of scriptures. Okay, Let, let's fast forward to verse 5. Okay, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Next. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature yet not the wisdom of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing next one but we speak the wisdom of god in a mystery the say this word with me the hidden wisdom which god ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew for had they known they would not have crucified the lord of glory but as it is written I has not seen nor ear heard nor have it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him but God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes the deep things of God let's pause for a moment so Paul is saying we have a forum where we speak wisdom And it's among the mature. We don't speak this anyway. So depending on who's in the room, we know how to acclimatize the language. Then he talks about uh, 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 th that this is our domain, the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom of God, which we speak among the mature. That none of uh, uh, the, the, the people of this age knew, nor the rulers of this age. Pause. The princes all throughout biblical time and history did not just employ intellect they employed spiritual power to make decisions so you'll notice that Pharaoh has magicians and sorcerers that by the counsel of all things intellectual that I have scribes, recorders, people that are acquainted with history before me. I also have a panel of those that are acquainted with the realms of the spirit in their diversities. I also have those that are good mathematicians that when a prince stands to take counsel and make a decision, he employs realms in the form of people. Shai. So, so the wisdom that he dispenses is not necessarily intellect. So when there's something that is difficult in our day, in our circumstances, we then call a forum. You magicians, tell me what's going on here. And these, this is how the princes of this world to this day operate which is one of the chiefest agendas to dumb down your spirituality to a place where it's safe and palatable so that they can continue to flaunt their diabolical agenda they don't even hide it anymore you are the only one that is forsaking the secret place to go and work hard i need you to hear me by the spirit babylon never promotes based on competence study it so Daniel being competent did not warrant him a promotion the only thing that it served is it kept him from sabotage Alibat, Alibat, Alibat. it kept him from sabotage but Babylon in its design does not promote hard workers Daniel was promoted with his companions based
based on supernatural intrusion the powers of the age so tell me this dream I'm not going to tell it to you but I'm expecting it from you the sorcerers deliberate king no one has ever made such a request Daniel says I know where secrets are found give me time that's the pattern we'll get into it later can we do a bit more study so, so Daniel and his companions, were, they weren't even promoted because uh, uh, it's a nice thing that Babylon wanted to do. They, Babylon was forced to do it because they don't know that level of power. All right. Whew. Let's go to the book of Psalm 90. Verse 1 and 2. Can, can we say this together? One, two, three, go. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all. Oh, that word generations is ages. Come on, you came for powers of the age to come. Can, can we look, can, can we trace through scripture what the Bible is talking about? Let's go to verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever, or, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So the, the constant figure that we see across ages is God. And this is from one end of everlasting to the other end of everlasting. So if we want to pull from something that is to come, which is an age, we don't inquire of the age. We inquire in where the age resides, which is God. He's called the Ancient of Days. Can we go forward? Let's go to John 3 verse 15. If you've been to Sunday school, you know this. So now we want to practicalize this thing. We're talking about the powers of the age to come. We want to know what these things are. What has the Lord given us? That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have, say it. Okay. Wow. What is eternal life? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's go to 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting and eternal in this context is the same word. Ne? Aenios Zoe. Aenios speaking agelessness, perpetuity. Zoe meaning the life of God, divine life, the life that is in Christ imparted in man. That life that Jesus gave you is not time bound. It is the fullness of who God is across the ages being dispensed in man. Let's go further. First John chapter 1. I hope this is not complex. No? It's, it makes sense. Say Jesus if you understand. Thank you. Thank you. First John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. 
the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us wow next verse okay that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ let's go first john chapter 5 verse 11. and this is the testimony that god has given us eternal life and this life is in his son wow so what we are looking for is in jesus now we have to study dynamics of excess if this is something that we have how can we embody it ourselves let's do a bit more study Lord Jesus let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 might not have the time to deal with everything but I pray that you hear my heart let's start it from verse 6 However, we speak wisdom among the mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So Paul is saying here that among the mature, we speak of a wisdom that if we are together, all of the rulers of this age, they can't access what we speak about. Then he starts giving us clues. Next verse. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Mystery in biblical context is not something that you never meant to understand. It means it is an exclusive truth. A guarded truth. It means musterion. You have to belong to a particular class to understand the language of that class. So when you get to the army, you will struggle to understand the language they use because they say stuff like watch your six you're like yeah six o'clock but what they are saying is that when you look at the clock six o'clock is downward in military terms that's your back so watch your six there's something that might be creeping up behind you the eagle has landed heaven what animals no 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 that's a flying aircraft that has landed in the vicinity of our jurisdiction. What are they talking there? Musterion. They understand it. You don't because you are an outsider to that class. So this class that he's speaking about here is called the mature. And there are certain truths that they are privy to because of that class. Now let's go a bit further the hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory pause so this wisdom is hidden for us not from us we are meant to apprehend it it doesn't exist in the context of this aeon age it exists in a hidden place in God so the mature are experts at investigations in the secret place. <sighs> Which none of the rulers of this age knew. Had they known, they would not have uh, uh, crucified the Lord of glory. Next verse. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of men, the things God has prepared for those who love him. This scripture is derived from Isaiah 64. It says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. What the Lord has prepared for those who wait for him. 
these are where the mysteries lie. That the mature are experts at waiting on God. They are not in a hurry. They know how to touch God in places. They know how to sit with God. They know how to commune with God. They know how to pull realities and far surpass those that were running. Can we go forward? Hey. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. John 17. Verse 2 and 3. Now we know that God has given us eternal life. We have to get into definitions now. What is this thing that he has given us? As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as have given him, as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true living God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The access is the knowledge of God. That is the move of God in these last days. And I'll show you why. Daniel 11.32 I know it's a lot of scriptures, just, yeah, let's, let's go for it. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know they are God, don't be in a hurry, ne? pause, shall be strong. That's the first product. That you communing with the Lord has this weird way of giving you strength. So when you feel weak, spend more time with God. Can I just address this while we are here? The person who wrote this is acquainted with Babylon, young people. The key to Babylon is not working hard. It's not you getting up in the morning and you're in a hurry to uh, uh, evade traffic and you are play, praying in tongues in a hurry. Hey, when I'm a gazer, that's not the pattern. The, the person that arguably had the busiest schedule is giving you the secret to Babylon. That you don't just wake up and go. You wake up and sit. Father, what is on your heart today? Says Sola Talima in Kempele, Sheshede Pelema. You don't do this scrolling your news feed. You don't do this scrolling your WhatsApp. There's etiquette to the secret place. Contrary to popular belief, God knows when He doesn't have your full attention. And he will not discharge sacred things to someone that doesn't have the decency to give him full attention. So you will go to work with those nuggets and no wonder your days are so stressful. So wake up and sit. If you are sharing spaces, you don't have to be loud. You don't have to flaunt your spirituality. You are pulling wisdom from a realm. You are pulling intellect from a realm. You are pulling future events from a realm. The mature understood that Christ would die. Don't have the time to get into that. The, the future is not an unknown thing to believers. He says in the same book, chapter 3, that all things are yours. Things present, things to come. Wow! So your days are not supposed to hit you by surprise. 
but there's a way to get there you sit with him they shall be strong and do exploits not try exploits not wake up in the morning and say I'm going to do an exploit no the exploits are a result ah! there is something that sitting with God does to you which results in strength and results in the exploits so you don't wake up in the morning saying shaka bata 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 I'm prepared for exploits gone no wrong pattern you sit can we go further I'm going to try to close let's let's fast forward to verse 12 uh first corinthians 2 Now we have not received the spirit of this world but the spirit who is from God that we may know the things God has freely given to us the spirit of this world which is the spirit of the age is an expert at blinding you that's why we struggle with things like identity we are struggling with a whole bunch of things because the spirit of this world is designed to cause you not to see but the spirit who is from god is a revealer but who does he reveal it to the ones that are always in a hurry no to the ones that have the patience and diligence to seek the spirit searches all things C- can i just disclose a few things i know young people will relate with this stuff you know uh, have you ever had those five minute prayers and you like Father I'm going through this this and this and that I need an answer now. <laughs> and nothing is coming. <laughs> But where young people tend to get confused is that God starts the conversation not where you have asked. Because he knows how to raise his kids. So father I want a car. And he starts speaking to you about anger. And it's like what does this thing have to do with my prayer? And because of your impatience you say ah amen. <laughs> you don't have the patience to sit with God as he discloses things that you don't even know about yourself. That that unattended anger of yours will get you killed on the road after he gives you a car. So he's answering your prayer. Alibati. Let's go further. Verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Your anger, foolishness. Haibo, you know. No can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Let's go further. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Next verse. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? This is one of the keys. He is saying in that manner of fellowship you have in the secret place. That is not necessarily the time to speak a lot. because your mental capacity does not at its fullest does not have the ability to impart new knowledge on god so he's saying that your prayer life ought to be wired in such a way that the direction of impartation of knowledge and all things spiritual is from him to you and not from you to him don't instruct the lord Then he says but we have the mind of Christ. What he's saying here is that in that place I am drawing from his perspective, from his knowledge, from his wisdom, and that is what I apply in my world. I don't get there and say, "Lord, I'm having trouble with my boss. I'm thinking we should kill him." 
that knowledge is very foolish and inferior. But you are saying, Lord, I'm not sure what's going on at work. I need your counsel. And step by step, he reveals to you what is going on and gives you instructional direction on how to deal with it, which you might not like. Can we wrap it up? So we know that God has given us eternal life. That life is in his son. He has said that the definition of eternal life is that they may know you. But how do we know the Lord? Through fellowship. Fellowship in its casual definition is conversation that is transformative. He who walks with the wise So, so, so the more time you spend with the Lord, engaging his word, engaging prayers, waiting on him, something starts happening to you. Philippians chapter 3. Can we pray in the spirit while we are going there? reached it. 
Then he says, but what thing I do, I press on toward the mark of the high calling in Christ. That is devotion. And it is the highest place that God has ordained for every believer. Because from that place of devotion flows all power, all wisdom that we need for our world. So the people that know their God will have access to that which they tend to go on a mountain for 40 days and pray for and not have the decency to be affectionate towards the giver. The way to access power is devotion, affection. You set your gaze on him. You set your heart on him. And yes, the secret place is designed to kill you. Because the dimension that you are wanting access into will kill you and the people you minister to if he doesn't kill you first. We are a people of the secret place. And where we are in the body right now is a time of seeking. There are too many hidden things that are in God that at best we scratch the surface and ignore the full body that is covered by the journey of devotion. I long for meetings where we have a start time and don't have an end time. I long for meetings just hear me by the spirit I long for meetings where worshippers understand who they are I must warn you there's something that is coming to the church which is the reverential glory of God and it will kill this commercialization this peddling of the gospel for money so worshippers must understand the way of the altar before they request an honorarium. Preachers, I hope you hear me. I hope you hear me. We are preaching him, not our belly. This gospel that we preach is costly. So we sit with him. How can I represent you well in my generation? We are sick of preachers that cook up a sermon in two minutes because they were lazy to journey with the Lord and they stand here in arrogance preaching a God that they have not seen in two weeks the covenant that you have been brought into is a covenant where distance is not allowed intimacy is the mark every preacher is a preacher because they love God Every worshipper is a worshipper because they love God. Every believer is a believer because they love God. Can we stand please? So we're going to do a practical exercise just quickly. Firstly, I want us to repent. The Holy Spirit will lead you in your heart. Uti, here and here and here. My guy, your motives were wrong. I know you say you want to preach my word, but you are after crowds. You are after money. And he journeys with you patiently in killing that thing so that you may emerge the preacher that he wants you to be. Let's pray. Father, we repent. We repent. There are so many things that we've supposedly done in your name that brought disrepute to who you are. You said in your word that my name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Teach us how to love you. Teach us how to journey with you. Teach us your ways. Teach us the ancient paths that we may walk therein. That we may walk therein. Now after that, I just 
want you to set your heart on Jesus and start drawing from him a little exercise father teach me what you want to teach me in this moment and just pray in the spirit This conversation will not start and end in the service. So continue it when you get home. But there are things that he wants to speak to you about. The Lord God has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning as one being taught. The Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. When he summons, I wake up. When he nudges, I go. When he beckons, I come to the place where we meet and I sit with him until he is done. Fellowship is the ordained way to oneness. It is the pathway that Jesus understood. He would withdraw a great deal before every day to come sit with the Father. The apostles got to know this pattern and it's, they said it is not good for us to now forsake that place and start waiting tables. We will give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That is the ancient pattern. We are a people who wait, a people who travail, a people who sit with Him. We conquer through devotion. We conquer through intimacy. We conquer through the knowledge of Him. Poof. It is not through an anointing. It is to, by pressing in to his heart.
attracted to death. Glory is attracted to death. The moment we die, he enters in a feminine way that we've always desired. Woo! Paying them Noria Kangai Yerkekanatoi Puridaria Kerbansai Saradaria Karbankano Urka Kanatai Just a few more seconds. Come on, let your heart die. Don't hold on, don't hold on, don't hold on. Let your heart die. In his presence. The reward you want is on the other side of that death. We have to understand how to carry the ark. Priests just don't walk anyhow. There's a way in which they have to walk so that they do not die because of that which they have the privilege to touch and handle. We are called to the heights, to the sacred places in God. And that place is demanding. It demands consecrations. It demands pure heartedness. It demands pure motives. You can't touch it with carnality.
I totally surrender my life to you. I am done pretending. I'm done coming to just coming to church without a relationship. I want you, Jesus. I want to exchange the life I have now for your life. It is me that you are talking to apostle. Take a step and come forward. Quickly. 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 This is the time for the youth. Please step out. Step out. Step out. One more person that is still deciding. You know you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And listen, we are not playing games here. I don't want to threaten you with hell. But just paraventure. You live here. And you fail, you sleep tonight and don't wake up. Are you really ready to meet with Jesus? You know, hell is real, heaven is real. I know you're young and you feel I have time to repent. But I've had young people that came here to church. We, we had a service one day and I was preaching and this young man was sitting somewhere around in front and was crying while I was preaching. His eyes were like black shot because he was weeping. Nobody knew what he was weeping for. But I made an altar call and he came out and gave his life to Jesus. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. Don't go there. Please come. Like I was saying, this young man gave his life to Christ and when he left church, he never got home. He was murdered on his way home. But thank God he came here. Now, you are in the best season of your life. Listen, many of us wish that we found Christ at the age you are. If we did, we should have been greater than where we are today. Somebody is still here and you feel, you know, I'm still too big for Jesus. How can I come out out here? How, I mean, how can they hold me? Uh -uh, there is no hope here. Life without Jesus is useless. I just need that one person that needs to make up their mind. Close your eyes, everyone, please. You are that person I'm talking to. Step out now. Step out. I need you here. I need you here. Quickly. Step out. Say, Lord, I give you my life. Take a bold step. Take a bold step. Say, Jesus, you brought me here for this reason. Many of the things that were said today, in most cases, would have bypassed you because you didn't even understand what they were talking about. Because your spirit was not ready for this kind of message. He said, no, I make up my mind that I'm going to make him the Lord of my life. Well, if you are not coming, all of you that are here, I want you to close your eyes and pray this prayer with me, mean it with all your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, say it like you are serious. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe with all my heart that you are the Son of God. You died for me. And on the third day, you rose from the dead. I now receive you into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Take my life and do something with it. And I declare that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Forgive me all of my sins and my past. Wash them away with your precious blood. And I thank you, Lord, for saving me today in Jesus' name. Amen. That's it. That's it. Uh, let's, let's pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you for this precious young people who have today come out to give their life to you in exchange for your life. Father, upon their confession in our Lord Jesus and in the resurrection, the scripture says, whosoever sins will remit, is remitted. We therefore as a church declare their sins forgiven. Wash their sins away as far as the east is from the west. And we pray for grace for the newness of life. That Father, from this day going forward, 
they will serve you and they will follow you all the days of their life satan i speak to you with authority and i command you take every luggage you brought into these lives and get out now in the name of jesus i speak the blessing of abraham into your spirit man and from today receive grace to serve god acceptably in jesus name amen that's it that's it quickly we want you to go to our sister right there we want to take your name and your phone number so we can be in touch with you to help you maintain this decision you have made today all right please just go with them for two minutes all right church can we put our hands together for the lord come on come on come on come on put your hands together for the lord glory to god we are about to close church listen the message is all the same go back to the secret place go back to seeking god this generation unlike our generation we didn't have the technology you have today we didn't have all the distractions we knew to stay in god's presence and you need to intentionally get rid of every distraction to say lord this one thing i must do is that i will keep pressing towards seeking you and i'll leave all these other things behind because church listen if you don't take this baton from the fathers a day will come you'll be alive when you tell somebody let's go to church they say go to hell i don't want anything with church god forbid but you will receive this fire and pass it on to the next generation can i hear an amen somebody let's go back to seeking him let's go back to the secret place every young person here must know the lord for themselves you must know him know him for yourself so that when you stand and speak you are speaking from depth of who you know that when you say to a demon hey stop there they will have to stop because of your knowledge remember he said paul i know jesus i know paul i know who are you that your name must be enlisted in that list so that when they mention your name demons know who, who it is why because of your depth of knowledge of him for they that do know their god they shall be strong and they shall do as well this is the days of the youth rise up it is your time it is your time so today as one of god's mouthpiece in this nation i declare buttons are handed over to you i said buttons are handed over to you buttons are handed over to you in the name of jesus christ Go in this thy might and take territories for Jesus. Go in this your might and take over this nation in the name of Jesus Christ. You will never be a failure all your life. From today, I place on you the mark of success. In everything you do, I declare I place on you the mark of success. You will excel, 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 you will excel in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I hand over this youth to you. These are young people you are preparing for the days ahead. Holy Spirit, take a hold of them. Just like Gideon set the foxes on fire. And they burn the whole families of the Philistines. Lord, today I set every one of them on fire.